All right, so with this video, we're going to continue with chapter two, but now we're going to start looking at the, the periodic table more. Um, and when we look at the, the periodic table, um, of course, we've got the version that we're, we're familiar with today. Um, so you can see here. Um, and as we, we go through this chapter, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit why we have kind of the, the different colors here. So you can see group one, see alkali metals, orange alkaline earth metals, purple is noble gases. Um, so we'll talk a little bit uh, about kind of how the, the periodic table is set up, how we can use it as a, a tool um, to understand different pieces of information about those elements. And then also in chapter, I think it's six later on in this quarter, um, we'll, we'll dive even more into it so we can identify certain trends within the periodic table. Uh, but when we think about the, the periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev is just known as the, the father of the periodic table. So this is uh, Mendeleev at the, the bottom here. Um, and he actually created this periodic table in 1869. Um, and if you look at it, it was a little different. Our current periodic table is organized based on atomic number, so the number of protons. Uh, this one is based on atomic mass, um, but the general details of it are essentially the same in the sense that each of these groups, so you can see group at the, the top here, um, each of these groups are based on chemical properties that we saw repeat. Uh, and if you look at the, the table you have here, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and the, the current one, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. So we still see that, that same thing. Um, and with the, the periodic table, you'll also note in this one, we've got a couple open spots, such as 44, 66. Um, so there are, are kind of missing pieces here just because certain elements hadn't been discovered at the, the time he was uh, making this, this periodic table. Um, but what he was able to do, since the, the periodic table itself is grouped so that each of these columns going up and down has similar properties, he was able to, to predict um, the properties of those missing elements. Um, and just in, in general, if we want to put a kind of definition or a term to, to what he was doing, it's known as the, the periodic law or periodicity. The, the properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. So we see these um, properties repeat periodically. And that's why we just refer to it as the, the periodic table. We see similar properties popping up again and again. And then when we look at the, the periodic table, um, these elements that are grouped together just have those similar properties. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, there were certain missing spots in his periodic table when he was first going. Um, those elements hadn't been discovered. He knew something belonged there. It just hadn't been determined what that, that element actually was. So if we look at the, the periodic table here, you can see carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, lead um, in, in group 14. But at the, the time, germanium hadn't been discovered. But based on where that open spot was on his periodic table and based what he knew, uh, and based on what he knew about the, the other elements in that group, he was able to predict how germanium would behave. So you can see here in green in the middle, his predicted properties for that element. And then after germanium had actually been discovered, you can see they were able to, to measure those. Um, and you'll see pretty good agreement between what he expected and the, the actual, just because he had an understanding that those properties are going to repeat. So we should see um, see something similar to what else is already in that group. And again, it's not perfect, but you can see um, his predictions pretty close to what they were, uh, what they actually are for, for that element. Um, and again, he was doing this before it had to even be discovered. Um, but then with the, the elements in general, if we want to get an idea of kind of where they come from, you can use this table to um, see just some of the, the different origins of those elements. So the, the Big Bang, hydrogen, helium, you can see a little bit of the, the lithium there. But just at the, the start of the universe, that's where we got those extremely light elements. And then just looking at the, the, the rest of this kind of key in the middle, you can see merging neutron star, dying low mass star, explo exploding white dwarf, exploding massive star. So you can see the rest of these are just going to be produced um, via different, essentially different processes within or involving stars. Um, and then it only goes up to, to 92 just because uranium is going to be our uh, heaviest naturally occurring element. Everything past uranium 
just known as those transuranium elements. Those are going to be the, the man-made ones. And that's why we're missing 90 through 93 through the, the rest of this row, and then all the way up to, to 118 once we pop back up to the uh, rest of that periodic table. Um, and then with the elements, we can use this just to see the, the abundance. So if we look at the, the axes on the, the x-axis, we just have atomic number. So we're just seeing all of the, the different elements as we add one additional proton each time. And then on the y-axis, we've got abundance. But notice this is a logarithmic scale. So each time we go up one unit, we're going up an order of magnitude. So there's about one unit between hydrogen and helium. So there's one order of magnitude more hydrogen within the, the universe. Um, we can see those are by far the, the most abundant elements. Um, and then we see a, a dip for lithium, beryllium, boron. Um, hop back up. So there's a, a little bit of bouncing around as we go through this, but we can see the, the general trend is as we go from the, the lighter to the, the heavier elements, we're just going to have less and less of those heavier elements. Um, on Earth, there actually is a helium shortage. So we used to use helium in my research in, in grad school, um, and we'll see why in a, a moment because it's just essentially unreactive. Um, but helium is basically so light that it can actually uh, essentially escape Earth's gravity. Um, so there is a, a shortage of helium there, even though it is the, the second most abundant element within the, the universe as a whole. Um, and then when we think about the human body, of course, we're going to be composed of, of matter, which is composed of atoms. So we're going to be made up of these different elements. We can see at the, the top here. So this is composition of the human body by mass. And if we think about it, it makes sense why oxygen would be the, the largest component by mass, because humans are roughly 70% water. And if we think about water, H2O, we've got two hydrogen atoms for every one oxygen. Um, but because the, the oxygen is going to weigh 16 AMUs, while the hydrogens will each weigh about one, the oxygen is going to make up the vast majority of the, the mass in water. And then since humans are mostly water, it makes sense that we see such a large portion of the, the oxygen there. Carbon, unsurprising. Carbon is going to be the, the backbone of all, all living organisms. So it's not surprising that we've got a whole bunch of that as well. Um, hydrogen, again, we have a ton of water. So even though hydrogen is only a small fraction of that, we have so much water um, that it's not surprising we've got a lot of hydrogen. And then hydrogen will also be in other things as well. Um, and then nitrogen and just others making up that, that last little bit. Um, and if we look at some of the specific examples, some of them you're, you're probably familiar with. So calcium in terms of bone and teeth. Um, so it's not surprising then uh, since cadmium, CD instead of CA, since cadmium can replace uh, calcium in bones, it's not surprising that cadmium exposure um, is problematic. And then there's also other toxic effects with it as well. Um, if we look at the, the blood, iron is going to be a big component because the, the hemoglobin itself is going to contain iron. And that's what helps transport oxygen throughout our, our body so our cells can do respiration. Um, and then if we look up here at the, the top, uh, right, nerves and control. If you've ever been working out or exercising and then you get a, a muscle cramp, um, you could drink some Powerade or, or Gatorade, um, those things that contain electrolytes. Um, you could eat a banana, which is high in potassium. Um, but essentially what we're doing is just looking for those electrolytes to help those nerve signals um, transmit properly. And that's the, the same thing when we're looking at electrolytes in those drinks. It's talking about these elements. It's talking about them in the, the ionic form. So we're going to have sodium plus or Cl minus, potassium plus, calcium two plus, whatever it may be. Um, but those electrolytes are just referring to these types of, of substances, these types of elements. Um, and then with the, the periodic table, there's going to be a couple different ways we can kind of structure it or organize it. Uh, but when we're looking at it just in general, the columns going up and down, so the vertical columns, we're going to refer to those as groups. Um, and like I was saying before, these are going to be where we see the, the same chemical properties. So if we think about group 17 in purple here, all of those elements are going to have similar chemical properties. Whereas if we move to group 16, now 16 and 17 are going to be different. But everything in group 16 will be similar to one another. Um, so the reason you can think of them as families is because just like with siblings for the most part, there's going to be a lot of similarities between those siblings. And again, they're not um, identical. So just like the, these elements, we're not going to have exactly the same thing with every element in a particular group. 
but we're we're going to have similar similarities in terms of the, the the properties of those elements in a given group. Um, and then with it, we're going to keep it simple and just use the numbering system one through eighteen. So one will be on the left hand side in red here. Eighteen would be kind of the I don't know what is that teal or that that lightish blue color on the the, the far side. Um, but just note there are different systems we can use to to kind of identify these. We're going to learn specific names for a few of these groups. Um, but in other cases, we've got A's and B's mixed in. And when we've got A's and B's, the A's are referring to the groups that are currently in these colors. So we'd have 1A, 2A, then hop across to the, the yellow, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. And we're going to learn those because these are the, the main groups. Um, and then in the middle, in that case, we would have 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B, all the way up to 12B. Um, so if you ever look at a, a periodic table, if you're looking at some other video or something, they may refer to it as 1A or 2B. Uh, actually, it'll be no 2B. Um, 7B, 7A, whatever it may be. But we're just going to do 1 through 18 straight across the, the top there. And the, the big thing is just recognizing with these groups, that's where we'll see similar chemical properties. With the, the pre periods, that's not going to be the case. So with it, the, the image I have here, the, the reason I kept it like this or, or used this one is because I think it allows you to see where these two rows at the, the bottom fit in. They go right in this kind of cutout spot. The, the reason we have them separated, though, is just because if we actually fit them in here, that would take these two groups on the left and push them all the way super far to the left. So if we wanted to fit the periodic table on a piece of paper, it would just be really difficult to fit it and then also keep the, the information in each of these boxes legible. Um, so we just separate out these, these two rows at the, the bottom. And then when we go through chapter six, we'll see specifically why it's these elements in particular that we separated rather than just taking any set of elements from from anywhere on the, the periodic table there'll, there'll be a reason why we've got these ones in particular at the, the bottom but again the, the big thing is the periods going across do not necessarily have similar properties we'll see in some cases there may be some similarities for for elements next to each other but we don't want to just assume that because it's not always going to be the case whereas with the, the groups elements in one particular group will have similar chemical properties um, and before we start to look at the groups in particular, um, like I said, we're going to focus on a few of them, learn um, the exact names for a couple of groups. But when we look at the, the periodic table in general, we can split it between metals and nonmetals. And what we have is what's known as kind of, a, or at least what I've heard referred to as and what I call it, is the, the staircase. Um, and you can kind of see why we've kind of got a, a staircase going up in the uh, metalloids here. So if we just look metal, are the, the blue? Non-metal are the, the greenish color, and then the metalloids in between, um, which actually have properties uh, of metal and non-metals. That's why they makes sense to have them kind of in between here as the, the divider. Um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, with these metalloids, just note that depending on where you look, there actually is some difference between what is considered a metalloid or not. Um, sometimes polonium is considered, sometimes astatine isn't. Um, so depending on where you're looking, this metalloid section may be actually sort of shaded differently um, in terms of which ones we're actually considering metalloids. So if there was ever a question on a quiz or a test or something for this class, and we were asking which of these is a metalloid, it would be pretty clear out of these um, because one answer may be pot uh, potassium, another one might be cobalt, third one might be like fluorine or chlorine, and then the fourth one would be something along this, this section here. Um, the only thing to note is aluminum is always considered a metal. So you think about the aluminum foil you use in your, your kitchen if you're wrapping up uh, food or something, shiny, looks like, like metal. Um, so we're always gonna consider aluminum to be, and then for the most part with the, the metalloids, Boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium. That's what I've seen most commonly referred to as the, the metalloids. And then, like I said, with these ones, polonium and acetine, there's some disagreement. Um, but even with arsenic, um, it's often lumped in as a, a heavy metal in environmental issues. Um, so even that one doesn't really fit perfect. 
So again, with the metalloids, we're just looking in this general area, but we can use those metalloids to divide between metals on the left, non-metals on the right. Um, and then just note hydrogen is the, the exception there. Um, and then even sometimes you'll see hydrogen may also be located above fluorine. And when we look at the exact way electrons are set up, we'll, we'll get an understanding of why hydrogen fits in this group, even though it's not a metal, and then also why it would fit in the 17th group as well. Um, and then sometimes you'll even see hydrogen separated more. So sometimes it's even further at the top to distinguish that it's not a metal like lithium through francium. Um, but this is kind of the, the most common place for it to be. And then when we think about the, the properties of metal and non-metal, I think metal is not surprising. Um, you may not be familiar with some of these terms like malleable and ductile. Um, but those just allow us to essentially work with the, the metal and shape it into to different forms. Um, whereas the, the non-metals are typically going to be very brittle. So you can almost think of the, the non-metals as kind of chalk-like. If we're thinking about solids, um, we can have gases, we can have warm liquid at, at room temperature for the, the non-metals. But if we're thinking about the, the solids for the, the non-metals, um, they're going to be brittle, not easily sort of manipulated in terms of the, the shape. Um, whereas the, the metals, we can bend them, we can hammer them into to sheets, um, we can uh, form them into to wires and things like that. And then of course, they're gonna be shiny. Um, there's typically sort of a, a nice ring to it if you hit it on the, the table. Um, and then of course, they're gonna be excellent conductors compared to, to non-metals. So whether we're thinking about electricity, think about the, the wires conducting electricity, they're always metal, they may be coated in a non-metal so that you can actually grab that wire without getting electrocuted. But the, the wires themselves that are conducting the electricity are certainly metal. And then with the, the conductor of heat, if you just think about cooking, you put your, your tray in the oven um, or you have your, your pot on the, the stove boiling water, the, the tray or the, the pot are gonna heat up extremely quickly relative to the, the food or the water, just because those metals are gonna be excellent conductors. Um, and then if you think about the, the non-metals, if you had like a wooden spoon and you put it on top of your boiling pot, the, the wooden spoon's not metal. It's not gonna be a good conductor of heat. So you could keep the, the spoon on there and it's not really gonna heat up as a, a, at all, really. It might warm up a, a touch, but especially compared to the, the pot, um, the non-metal spoon's not really gonna, gonna get too, too hot. Um, and then with the, the metalloids, if we go back for a section, second, um, in the, the periodic table, they're in between the, the metal and the non-metal. What we're going to see with their properties um, is it kind of is between a metal and a non-metal as well. So depending on the, the metalloid, depending on the, the property, it may be like a metal in some aspects. It may be like a non-metal in others. Um, in some cases, it may be sort of an average of the, the two. Um, but we just want to think of the, the metalloids as kind of uh, an in-between between the, the metal and non-metal, whether we're thinking about it in terms of the, the properties or in terms of its position on the, the periodic table. Um, and then with the, the periodic table, uh, like I said, we're going to have 1 through 18, like we see here for the, the groups. But you can see why with the, the main group here in green, why we go 1A, 2A, 3A through 8A. Um, because the, the main groups are going to be the, the pieces on the, the side that kind of stick up higher than the, the middle of the periodic table. And with the, the main group, this is going to be typically what we focus on the most. So a lot of the times when we're looking at different examples, we're going to be focused on elements in these uh, the, the main group section. Um, we'll occasionally talk about these transition metals in the, the middle. Um, if we ever use a colored solution in the, the lab, um, it's almost guaranteed to be one of these transition metals because those tend to give us the, the pretty colors. Um, but we'll, we'll do some work with the, the transition metals and then the inner transition metals, so these two rows at the bottom. Um, when we look at how electrons are set up, we'll talk about these. When we talk about um, nuclear chemistry in the third chapter, we'll, we'll talk about some of these. But for the, the most part, we're not really going to do too much with this uh, inner transition metals at the, the bottom there. Um, but we do have particular groups of the, the periodic table that we're going to focus on. And we're going to look at the groups on the, the side. So we're going to look at the, the two groups on the, the left, the four groups on the right, and then even with these ones on the right, um, we're, we're primarily going to focus on the, the two on the side. So we're probably kind of looking at one and two, 17 and 18 mostly. We'll, we'll talk about 15 and 16, and then these transition metals will come up uh, at some points. 
Um, but with the group 18, we're going to start with the, the noble gases, so all the way to the right-hand side. Um, and with these ones, they're kind of the, the most boring just because they're completely unreactive. So like I said, with one of the later chapters, we'll focus on how electrons are set up and we'll get a better understanding on why we see the, the properties that we're going to describe here. Um, but essentially, these elements have the, the perfect setup in terms of their electrons. They have the, the most stable electron configuration. So because of that, they're not going to want to gain electrons. They're not going to want to lose electrons. And that's pretty much all a chemical reaction is, is we're going to see breaking and forming bonds. And that's just going to be the, the electrons involved in that. So since these electrons aren't going to do anything, we're just not really going to see any reactions. And that's why helium makes a excellent replacement for hydrogen in uh, blimps. So if you've ever heard of the Hindenburg, um, the, the, the blimp that essentially just caught on fire and crashed, um, I forget when that was, but I believe it was early to mid 1900s. Um, but whenever it was, uh, the, the reason it did catch on fire is just because they were using hydrogen to inflate it. We use helium, though, completely unreactive. It's not going to be flammable like hydrogen is, so we just don't run that risk. Um, and then looking at some of the other ones here, neon, which is neon lights. Um, if you've ever gotten an MRI, there's a really powerful magnet in there that we need to keep cold. Um, and these, these gases make ep excellent... Um, uh, cooling agents for, for that. So you might use Krypton or, or something like that for the, the MRIs. And then radon, uh, I believe I talked about earlier on in either this chapter or, or chapter one, um, but just talking about like the uh, radon in the, the Rocky Mountains. Um, so they typically have radon detectors in, in homes um, just to make sure that concentrations not get to a harmful amount because this radon is going to... Um, release alpha particles, which is going to release that, that radiation that could do damage if you're to, to breathe in the radon first. Um, and now hop into the, the left side of the periodic table, group one alkali metals. Um, so again, hydrogen is not a metal. So that's why we have it excluded from the, the top here. Even though it's in group one, it's not considered one of these alkali metals. Um, but with the, these metals, we're going to see that they're extremely reactive. So even if we just had pure sodium or pure potassium, we just left it out. Eventually, it's going to react with the, the water vapor in the air um, and just essentially kind of catch on fire. So we'll have a, a demonstration with potassium and then maybe sodium if we have it. I don't remember if we do or not, though. Um, but these are going to be so reactive because essentially they just have one electron that they really want to lose. So it's going to be really easy for pretty much anything to kind of come along and take that electron from any of these alkali metals. Um, and then with it, if you've ever heard of a lithium ion battery, we're just looking about lithium in the, the positive one form. So it's just going to lose that, that valence electron. Um, the atomic clock uses cesium in order to keep uh, time extremely precisely. Um, and then going back to the, the batteries, actually, for a second, with the, the lithium, lithium is relatively expensive. It's relatively difficult to extract from the, the earth, the earth or um, it's very energy intensive if we wanted to get it from ocean water. Um, so if we're thinking about a potential replacement for the lithium ion battery, it would make sense that we would look at an element in that same group. So we would look at something below lithium and see if any of those would be a, a reasonable replacement um, because they're going to have the, the most similar chemical properties to lithium. And what's currently being done is there's a ton of research into sodium ion batteries, just because sodium is more uh, readily available, it's cheaper, so it would make an excellent alternative to, to lithium. Um, there are some issues, just because, again, these aren't identically the, the same, they're not perfect matches. They're similar properties, but they're not identical. Um, so there's some issues in terms of the, the size of those batteries. Um, I think the, the rechargeability is not as great with, with sodium in terms of how many cycles you can get. Um, before it essentially just has no more sort of juice left in the battery. Um, but there's a, a ton of research going into to sodium batteries. There may even be some into potassium ion batteries, but I am not too familiar with that if there is. Um, I wouldn't be shocked, but uh, I think sodium is definitely receiving a, a lot of attention at the moment.
Um, and then the group two, so just moving over to the, the right one, um, you can kind of think of these as sort of the, the younger sibling of the, the group one alkali metals, um, because these are going to have a lot of those same properties. But now that we've got two valence electrons, so alkali metals only had the one that they really wanted to lose. In this case, the, the alkaline earth metals have two. So that's just going to kind of reduce that, that reactivity slightly. So these are still going to be reactive, just less so. Um, and then with the, the picture on the right, that's Marie Curie. Um, so she's the only person in history to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry and physics. Uh, but she actually discovered radium at the, the bottom here. Um, she also discovered polonium, and then she did a, a bunch of work with x-rays around the, the time of the First World War. Um, so she was uh, constantly surrounded by, by radiation. Ultimately, that is what led to her uh, death. Um, she did live to, I think, her mid to late 60s, um, so not not super young, but... Um, I think she had wound up getting uh, some sort of like anemia related to the, the radiation exposure. Uh, but currently her like lab notebooks and, and other materials are on display in a museum, but they're so radioactive that um, they have to be kept uh, specially contained just so that, that other people aren't exposed to that, that radiation. Uh, but just with radium, it's got a, an interesting history. Um, in the 20th century, radium was used in a lot of different uh, commercial um, products. So even things like, like toothpaste had, had radium in it. Um, uh, watches often had radium painted on it just so that the, the, the hands could be seen at night. Um, but radium is going to be radioactive, like we've said. So with the, um, the, the watches, there was actually what's known as the, the radium girls. And they were essentially a, a group of women that would paint uh, radium paint onto the, the hands of those watches so that they would glow at night. Um, but if you think about the, the hand of a watch, it's going to be very small. So you need a very fine tip on that, that paintbrush in order to uh, paint it well. And what the, the, the women would do is paint a watch and then they would place the uh, paintbrush in their mouth just to, to kind of get that fine tip back. But because the, the radium paint contained radium, they were then ingesting that substance. Um, and then if you think about doing that, that job for multiple hours uh, a day, multiple days a week for weeks at a time, if not months and years, um, that's going to be a, a lot of exposure. So these women ultimately wound up getting sick and then getting uh, radium jaw, which in the, the best case scenario is kind of just like extra jaw. And then in the, in the worst case scenario, you kind of just have your, your jaw almost fall off, basically. Um, so this can be quite a, a nasty, nasty substance. Um, with it, though. You do need to ingest it to feel the primary effects of it. Um, so with Marie Curie, I believe most of her sickness was probably attributed to the, the x-rays that she was around a lot rather than radium itself. Um, but in the, the past, um, for, for cancer treatments, what they would sometimes do is essentially on the, the tumor itself, just kind of cut you open, place some, some radium in there so that the, the radiation can then kill those cancer cells. But of course, that's going to expose um, the, the rest of your body to that, that radiation as well. So it's not a ideal uh, treatment. And that's why we, we, of course, no longer do that. Um, although I do believe we were doing that later than you may, may expect. Um, and then with these next two, I'm going to go through them kind of quickly just because they're not too terribly interesting. Uh, but it is important that we have the, the names here. Um, so with the, the nitrogen family, group 15. We're going to refer to that as the panictogens. Um, and with these ones, one thing that, that does make them interesting is they have a lot of bonding ability in the sense that they can form multiple bonds, so double or triple bonds. Um, but with these ones, um, we're not going to spend uh, a lot of time on them just because they're not quite as, at least in my mind, interesting. We'll see them throughout in different compounds. Um, and we may talk about it. And like arsenic, of course, is a very toxic substance, um, but not too much to, to say at the, the moment. Similarly with the, the calcogens, um, so group, group 16, just moving one over to the, the oxygen family. Um, with these ones, so you see oxygen and sulfur at the, the top. A lot of the times if we do find metal, so if you had like copper, likely wouldn't just be pure copper. So you'd have like copper oxide or copper sulfide. Um, and that should be 
sulfi, not sulfids. Um, but these elements, particularly oxygen, are going to be really good at taking electrons from somebody else. And when I say somebody else, I mean another atom. Um, but with it, that electronegativity is something that we'll talk about in the, the sixth chapter. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it in the sixth chapter. Um, but one that I do want to talk about a little bit more is the, the halogens of group 17. So you can see fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Just like with the alkali metals in group one, these are going to be extremely reactive, um, but for kind of the, the opposite reason. Whereas the, the alkali metals have one electron that they really want to give up, these halogens are kind of have a, an empty spot, basically, for one more electron that they really want to take. Um, and that's why if we think about something like sodium chloride, NaCl, um, we're not actually going to have a, a bond like we have here. What we're going to have is sodium forming a positive ion. It's going to give up an electron. Chlorine is going to form a negative ion because it's going to take that electron. And then those opposite charges are going to hold the sodium and the chloride together. Um, but with these elements, um, they're often in substances that are used for um, pesticidal purposes. Um, and a lot of the times, if they're not, they're also in substances that are going to persist in the environment for a really long time. Um, so you can think of these elements as biocides. They're just going to be toxic to living organisms, particularly chlorine and fluorine. Um, and then what they also do is form really strong bonds with carbon. So because they're biocidal, they'll be resistant to microbial degradation. And then because they have a really strong bond, they're going to be resistant to degradation from heat, so thermal degradation, uh, light, photo degradation. Um, they'll also be resistant to hydrolysis, so just essentially breaking down from a reaction with water. Um, so with these substances, a lot of the times if they contain these elements, they, they last in the environment for a long time. Um, so one current example of that is going to be PFAS, so per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Essentially what that's referring to is just a chain of carbons. So alkyl, if you take organic chemistry, alkyl will refer to just a carbon chain. And then the per and polyfluorinated, the PF part, is just telling us we've got a bunch of fluorine surrounding that one. Um, and then these substances, these PFAS molecules, have a lot of desirable properties because, like I said, they're resistant to heat, they're resistant to, to water, they're resistant to um, photodegradation, all that, that type of stuff, um, which makes them excellent in applications like raincoats, like skis, non-cooked stickwear, a whole bunch of different things. So they're produced in large quantities which then allows them to be released into the environment in relatively large quantities. Um, but then because they don't break down, they just stay in the uh, environment for extremely long time, so decades upon decades. And that's why they're sometimes referred to as forever chemicals. Um, so with these PFAS molecules, there's been studies looking at their concentrations in extremely remote locations. There's been studies looking at their um, concentrations in rainwater. There's been studies looking at their concentrations within human blood samples. Um, and within all of those different types of samples, they pretty much always come back positive for, for some amount of PFAS, just because these are going to be ubiquitous, meaning that they're, they're present, present pretty much everywhere throughout the, the, the globe. Um, and with it, um, like I said, PFAS is just a sort of a, a class of chemicals. So what sometimes happens is they'll they'll ban because they're endocrine disruptors, so they're they're not beneficial to be exposed to. Um, but what they will will sometimes do is ban a specific PFAS molecule. Um, but then what companies can do is essentially just alter that molecule slightly. So they can add a, a couple extra carbons in there, change the, the number of fluorines, so that it's technically a different molecule. But it's going to have very similar properties. It's going to behave the same. It's going to affect organisms in a very similar manner. Um, so what some people are, are currently calling for, and what I think makes the, the most sense, is just a, a ban on those type of molecules, rather than handling it on sort of a case-by-case -case basis, and then just allowing those different sort of um, versions of these molecules to, to be utilized by those companies. Um, and then if you're interested in PFAS more, I'd recommend there's a, a John Oliver 
uh, clip that's about 20 minutes. So he goes through uh, a couple of different studies. He talks about the effects. He talks about some of the companies that are responsible for producing and then releasing these uh, chemicals into the environment. Um, I think there's specific situations in North Carolina and Michigan where uh, people have been exposed in extremely high, high concentrations. Um, but that's a, a good video to check out if you're more interested in those PFAS molecules. Um, but with this one, just with your, your periodic table, take a moment, you'll want to pause the video because I'm just going to click through it. But you want to pause the video and just see if you can identify based on these descriptions, what elements being referred to, just so we can get a little practice with group versus period, as well as some of the, the names of these groups. Um, and the, the reason for that is just because when we look at the, the second one, there's going to be an easy way to kind of mess that up. Uh, but if you do want to pause the, the video so you can practice, just go ahead because I'm going to click through and show the answers in three two, one. Um, but the, the main reason I wanted to point this out is just, especially with the group 16 period two, that's going to be oxygen. But if you look at group 16, oxygen is going to be at the top. So it'd be easy to look at oxygen and then see period two, just go to that second element, go to sulfur. Um, but just note that only the, the first period, or I should say only groups one and 18 have an element in the first period. So depending on where we're located, we may not actually have an element in that period. So with groups 2, 3, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, those all start in period 2. And then with groups 3 through 12, those are all going to start in period 4. Uh, but now when we look at the, these five examples, we want to think about which of them is going to be most chemically similar to each other. And remember, we're thinking about which are in the same group rather than which are in the, the same period, so which are in the same column going up and down, and that'll give us chlorine and fluorine. So even though oxygen is right next to fluorine, those are in the, the same period, but not the same group, we're not going to see the exact same types of chemical, or we're not going to see as similar chemical properties. There will be some similarities between oxygen and fluorine, uh, but fluorine and chlorine, same group, both halogens, we're going to have much more similarities there. Um, and then with the next video, we'll start to look at how these elements come together to form compounds, because there's going to be a couple different types of compounds that we'll, we'll be uh, focused on, ionic and covalent. But for now, I'm going to stop the, the video here, um, and then we'll pick up with that one next time.